Economics and Research Fellow at IAB. Uh, his current research focuses on the creation, dissemination, privacy protection, and use of linked longitudinal data on employees and employers. Uh, so uh, I, I'm hoping Alexandra's technical difficulties have been resolved because I'm about to turn things over to her. Alexandra will be giving us uh, an explanation of differential privacy for a non-technical audience. Alexandra, are you there? I don't believe she's been able to connect yet. So Michael, I know you know quite a bit about differential privacy, not to put you entirely on the spot, but I will. Um, uh, could you give just a really brief uh, layperson description of what differential privacy is? Uh, I can attempt to do so, um, but I certainly would defer to, to Alexandra and John as the, the much more substantial experts on this topic. Um, kind of put in layman's terms, um, I think it's easiest to, to understand differential privacy if you kind of put it in the context of, of where we've come from with privacy in, in public data. Um, over the years, uh, particularly since I would say roughly the 70s, um, our understanding of the risk of re-identification has improved substantially. Um, I think in, in the earlier days, of concern about, about re-identification, uh, approaches to what was considered personally identifiable information or individually identifiable information um, largely revolved around like a few core direct identifiers, uh, things that would uniquely identify an individual and, and thoughts about privacy in, in public data releases um, really re revolved around, okay, remove those direct identifiers uh, and you can't figure out who the, the remaining data uh, relates to. Um, that very quickly um, was, was recognized as insufficient to protect privacy, um, that you can easily uh, often re-identify individuals through one or more additional characteristics, uh, be they geographic characteristics, demographic characteristics, et cetera. Um, and as kind of the understanding of what is personally identifiable information as opposed to just direct identifiers um, became more sophisticated. Uh, the, the toolbox that organizations used uh, to try to protect privacy also became more sophisticated. Um, but those tools largely relied on a, a, a few approaches. Um, either it involved removing data, suppressing it in one form or another, uh, it involved um, reducing the precision of the data uh, through aggregation, through blurring, through rounding or, or reporting data in ranges, or it involved in some form perturbing the data uh, to introduce noise or uncertainty uh, so that you couldn't pick somebody out um, with, with a high degree of, of certitude. Um, but those techniques uh, are largely more of an art form than a science in that they all serve to reduce the likelihood or reduce the ease with which um, a potential bad actor who's trying to find individuals uh, in the data, uh, it, it reduces the likelihood that they can or it reduces the ease with which they can re-identify. Uh, but it doesn't um, do so in, in, any, um, in any kind of quantifiable way. Uh, it, it's often a, a subjective call of, okay, just how, how protected are these data? And a determined, uh, a determined actor with access to um, the right external information or, or the right related data about those individuals could often um, kind of back their way into, into data sets uh, and still pick out individuals. And, and as computing technology has improved um, and as the, the, amount of data about individuals and businesses has substantially increased over the years, um, that re-identification exercise has just become more and more easy um, to, to, to perform. So the, 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 the discipline of differential privacy, I don't want to call it a technique because I think it's, it's more than just a single technique. It's, it's really an approach. Um, but the, the discipline of differential privacy um, 
came, had, it had its origins in the computer science world uh, as a, a, a logical way of, of approaching privacy and, and approaching um, anonymity in data um, from kind of from first principles. And, and it was structured and, and developed to, to provide a way to give concrete guarantees uh, uh, about the privacy of the data and the confidentiality of the data that people are, are contributing, uh, be it in a survey or in a commercial setting or in a census, a uh, variety of, of situations. Uh, so I think where differential privacy provides substantial promise to the, uh, to the data community uh, and to the privacy community is in, in its ability to quantify um, the risk and quantify the protections that are being afforded to data. Uh, and, and that holds true today and 30 years from now when other data about individuals are available. Um, I think one of the, the big concerns that I know federal agencies um, often face is you can apply your protections to data today, but you don't know what the risk against those same data are going to be tomorrow if other data become available. Um, and, and differential privacy really provides a way to to have a, a very quantifiable scientific approach to protecting privacy. Um, as I know John is gonna talk about in, in, his, uh, in his presentation, there, there are challenges in that. And there's, there's particularly challenges in terms of kind of what the resulting data look like and their usability for the variety of purposes that we have come to, to expect um, our, our data releases to be used for. Um, but it, it certainly is um, a, a promising technology, a certainly promising approach, um, and, and it will help to solve, if, it, if implemented, it'll help to solve many of the challenges that um, data practitioners have been facing up until, up until now. Um, I'm hoping Alexandra is on because I am running out of things to say. We appreciate it. Uh, thank you, Michael. Um, we're going to go ahead, uh, since Alexandra is still having some technical difficulties at her end um, connecting, um, and have John um, go first. So, uh, John, we have your slides up, and you should be unmuted, I think. I believe I'm unmuted now. Yes, you are. So, John, okay. if you want to go ahead with your presentation, and thank you again, uh, Michael, for explaining some of the basics um, to us. All right, I will go ahead. I assume you can all hear me okay. I just offered to broadcast yes, my face talking, but apparently you've disabled my camera, so uh, I will be a disembodied head. Uh, please go to slide two. Can you hear me? Yes, we do. Oh, there we go. Okay. All right. So uh, uh, since I'm appearing in my official capacity, uh, the slide I want is the one that has the disclaimer on it, please. Slide two. I'm appearing in my official capacity, so I need to display the disclaimer slide. Um, the opinions that I'm stating are my own. Um, please go to slide two. And I want to acknowledge the contributions of that long list of collaborators in the first two bullets. I won't read them, but I'll leave the slide up long enough for you to read them. I'm going to talk about work on the economics of privacy protection that's uh, joint with collaborators at uh, Georgia and Cornell, and then specific applications to the 2020 Census of Population. Uh, for those of you familiar with the differential privacy literature, you'll notice nestled in that list of collaborators are uh, Dan Kiefer, Ashwin Machanabahala, uh, Simpson Garfinkel, Jerome Micklau, Michael Hay, uh, I didn't call myself out, uh, pe people who have been involved in, the, in this formal privacy world for quite some time. I think it's quite a capable team, and I'm uh, delighted to be able to talk a little bit about their work today. Okay, now we can go to the next slide. These are, uh, any opinions expressed in this talk are my own, and not necessarily those of the Census Bureau. Next slide, please. So Wait, we're on the next slide. There we go. Apologies for the delay. Uh, so I'm going to talk about the motivation 
for formal privacy systems, differential privacy being the leading one. Um, Michael did a very nice job of introducing differential privacy for uh, a non-technical audience. And he took the disclosure limitation approach of we were having trouble controlling our ability to um, restrict re-identification in publications. Uh, that has been the long-term goal of what I call traditional statistical disclosure limitation or SDL. But really, the big bang event in disclosure limitation happened in 2003 when two computer scientists who are uh, specialists in cryptography, uh, Ira Diner and Kobe Nassim, moved from cryptography into safe data publication. And they published a paper in 2003, uh, which I always refer to as the Database Reconstruction Theorem. Uh, that's not actually the title of the paper. I don't even remember the title of the paper, but I, I guarantee you that Diner and Nassim 2003 will find it for you. What that remarkable paper did was it showed that if you had a confidential database and you kept publishing statistics from it that were accurate, that eventually, with a finite number of publications, you expose the microdata that you base those statistics on with near certainty. So I put in English the mathematics. The mathematics is very strong. It basically said, if you're not adding noise to the data, then for sure, if you publish too many things, you're basically publishing the microdata. So that changed the ball game in fundamental ways because the process that Michael described of trying to figure out whether an external attacker had enough information to reconstruct or re-identify is the term we use, uh, one or more of the individuals who happen to be in your database is a wholly different exercise from saying, have I actually published so much data that without anybody else's help, you can reconstruct the data on individuals that are in my database. It turns out that in order to design systems that protect statistical agencies from revealing too much information about their confidential databases in their own publications, they have to apply rules to them that as it turn out, protect those same publications from any external data that somebody might have as well into the indefinite future. So while it's, there's a great tendency to stress the bad news associated with formal privacy systems, which I will get to, trust me, the good news is that uh, when you do it and you do it right, you can release it and forget about it. So let's go on now. The first, I'm gonna show you why statistical agencies need to worry about this. Next slide, please. So in the 2010 census of population, I got the basic results on the screen. There were 308,745,538 persons in the US population enumerated in the 2010 census. That, by the way, is also the exact number of records in the confidential database from which all the statistical tabulations were published. Uh, that's, I'm not violating any uh, confidentiality by telling you that. That's exactly what all of our technical documents say, and it's true. There were 308, 300,758,215 persons living in what we call households, 7,987,323 persons living in what we call group quarters, and among those households, there were 116,716,292 households. Those numbers are exact. And they describe the total population, the household population, the group quarters population, and the number of households, which is the same as the number of occupied housing units. Next page, please. So if you want to describe the 2010 census, Here's the database schema for the statisticians in the room. This is the, this is the sample space at high level. So there were a little over 10.6 million habitable blocks. A block is inhabitable if it's entirely in water. We don't put a MAF ID on points in water. We do put MAF IDs on points around the edge of the water, though. And habitable John, and let me just, John, can I interrupt? Um, the sure. MAF is the master address file, correct? Oh, excuse me, the master address file. Yes, if I fail to expand an acronym, catch me right away. 
We do not put a master address file ID on spaces in the middle of water. So that's why I can talk about habitable blocks and habitable tracks. Uh, I see there's a question. Should I take the questions in stream? FPF has permission to make my slides available. Yeah, I'll, I'll monitor questions, John. You can just go okay. ahead. Okay. All right. So there are a little over 73.8, uh, there's 70, 74,000 habitable tracks. We identify two sexes. In the internal file, 115 values for age, uh, 126 values for race and ethnicity using the official OMB categories. This is in 2010. Uh, a little over, around 600 categories in using our own detailed categories, which appear in summary file two. We have at the base uh, 15 relationships to person one plus two more that, that relate to group quarters. And so if you, if you tabulate up the national data from the census, there's 492,660 cells in that national histogram, which has never been published. But that would be the description of the nation summarizing all the information in the 2010 census. Uh, next slide, please. So what did we actually publish? So we actually published linearly independent. That means these numbers, one of these numbers cannot be derived by adding and subtracting from any of the other numbers. Linearly independent redistricting data, 2.8 billion statistics. The rest of summary file one, another 2.8 billion statistics. Summary file two, 2.1 billion statistics. Just to, to show you how, how little the public use microsample contributes to this, in the public use microsample, another uh, 30.1 million statistics. And so the lower bound on the number of published statistics from the 2010 census was 7.7 .7 billion. And that's 25 statistics per person. Yes, the Census Bureau applied disclosure limitation to the files before these statistics were calculated. Nevertheless, reconstruction of the confidential microdata is certainly at least a plausible possibility when you're publishing that much information from the same confidential data. And we have been investigating uh, that uh, plausible possibility intensively here inside the Bureau. Next slide, please. So the bottom line is the database reconstruction theorem is the death knell for traditional data publication systems from the confidential sources. We are re-engineering all of our publication systems because they were not designed to protect against a reconstruction attack, and they may not, in fact, protect against reconstruction effects. If they did, it would only be by, co by coincidence and not by design. Differential privacy doesn't protect against a reconstruction attack either. It lets you, as Michael so nicely explained, it lets you quantify the global disclosure risk with a number that actually means something so that if you respect that number, you can state the accuracy with which the data that you have published allow potential reconstructions of the microdata. You can quantify the trade-off between data accuracy and privacy protection with reliable indicators. Next slide, please. So we'll do a little economics. I really just did it for you. A confidential database is a finite resource. There's a limited number of bits in that confidential database. And if you expose all the bits, you have effectively exposed the entire confidential database. There are competing uses for this scarce resource. Accuracy, which we also call fitness for use. So you want the statistics that you publish to be usable for the purpose for which they're published. That, I, I, don't want to, I don't want to assert that that's obvious, but it's certainly a correctly stated competing use. The other competing use is you want to protect the privacy of the people who are in that database, not just for statutory reasons, but also for ethical reasons. And every publication involves some small expenditure of the privacy of the individuals because it is some information leakage from that database. So every publication is some information leakage. You cannot, you cannot, you, 
you cannot manage a publication system unless you can do global accounting on how much information you have leaked from the confidential data. So if you wanted to do optimal resource allocation in this situation, you all know I'm an economist, you have to set the opportunity cost of getting more accuracy in terms of privacy loss, also called the marginal rate of transformation, equal to the marginal willingness to pay for extra accuracy in terms of privacy loss, also called the marginal rate of substitution. Both the accuracy and the privacy in this context are public goods. That means that they're non-excludable. So if I publish a statistic, anybody can use it. And if I use differential privacy as my privacy protection, everyone in the target population is protected and they cannot escape from that protection. They're also a non-rival. When you use a statistic that the Census Bureau publishes, you don't use up any of it. Somebody else can use that statistic and it's just as good or just as bad as it was in the first use. When you protect privacy with differential privacy, you also aren't using up the privacy protection. When I protect anyone in this audience with differential privacy, I've also protected everyone else in this audience with differential privacy, and one person's protection isn't at the expense of any other person's protection. That's what it means to be non-rival public good. So we got two non-excludable, non-rival public goods. In principle, the privacy protection could be excludable. I could say you don't get privacy protection and just publish your data, but Title 13, Section 9 prevents the Census Bureau from acting that way, so we're gonna treat, we're gonna treat it as also non-excludable, all right? So if I turn the whole publication system over to a private supplier and say, here are the confidential data, you must protect privacy using differential privacy, um, but you can publish and sell as much of the data as you want, so the Google or Apple problem, they're going to suboptimally provide accuracy and suboptimally protect privacy. So the, it is in the society's interest to manage the public goods properly, and that's how the Census Bureau interprets its mandate to develop a privacy-preserving publication system. Next slide, please. So now we do a little bit of computer science. This is the part that, uh, that uh, Alexandra would have talked about ahead of me. But essentially, to make this work, you have to set the privacy protection system up with formal definitions. You have to say, what's your database? So on the application to the 2010 census, or to the 2020 census, my database is the records on all the persons that were enumerated in that census. And then you have to say, what's a neighboring database? Now this is the hard concept, and I'll try to make it comprehensible in lay terms. A neighboring database is a database that looks just like the one you're trying to protect, except something's been changed. The easiest way to think about it is one row's been dropped, but another way to think about it is the characteristics of two people in that database have been exchanged. Either of those ways of thinking about it can you use to define neighboring databases. Then you've got to say, what are you allowed to ask? What questions or queries are you allowed to put to the database? The simplest one, the one we, we work, we'll work with all through this talk is, how many people in the database satisfy this condition? They live in this geography, they have this sex, they are of this age range, they have this race and this ethnicity. Those are counting queries, or computer scientists call them histogram queries. Statisticians would call them contingency table cells. Then you have to design a way of adding noise to these queries, which is called the randomized query response mechanism or the randomized publication mechanism. Those are the key mathematical inputs. And then differential privacy is a definition of if your randomized query response mechanism can do this, then you afford this level of protection, usually called epsilon, to all of the publications and to all of the people in the database, potentially or actually. As soon as you do that, there's an implied measure of accuracy for the released data and you can calculate it. Next slide, please. So those implied measures of accuracy uh, can can uh, vary. This is a pretty busy slide. I apologize for it. Some measures of accuracy are more suitable to some applications than others. Sometimes there's a measure of accuracy that comes out of the mathematics as the natural one, but most of the time the measure of accuracy depends on what application you're trying to make the data suitable for use. So um, we use a couple 
that, that are um, defined at the bottom of this slide. We use one that's the total variation distance. And that total variation distance can be normalized by the size of the population you're trying to protect. Uh, that has the interpretation of the percentage accuracy relative to just publishing the data without protection. And that's the one I'll use for most of the rest of this talk. Another natural one is the mean squared error or the L2 error associated with the dis difference between the actual confidential answer and the published answer. In both cases, you're taking an expectation of this. So it's not, you don't talk about the actual accuracy, you talk about the expected accuracy given the randomization. Next slide, please. So if I'm gonna do this for the census of population, the easiest table to talk about is the redistricting data. So what are the redistricting data? They are the counts of the number of people who live in every block in the United States then aggregate it up to any geography that you can build based on a census block. Or the census block, as I told you in 2010, there were about 10.7 million habitable census blocks. It's the smallest units of geography that we publish the data on, and it's specifically designed to allow state legislatures to, um, to uh, appoint a redistricting commission and redistrict every legislative district from the congressional districts in that state down to the smallest congressional district or large legislative district that has elective, elected officials in the state. These are done every 10 years, and the basic input is these redistricting data, which in addition to population counts also have the voting age population, and they have the number of people in the different race and ethnicity groups that are protected by Section 2 of the Voting Rights Act. This has to be released by April 1st of the year following a decennial census. So the one we're going to, the 2010 one was released before April 1st, 2011. The one for the 2020 census will be released by April 1st, 2021. Next slide, please. Next slide. Thank you. So this is an example of the congressional districts um, that, that get drawn. And I'm going to take the geography all the way down. Next slide, please. So when, so when you take the geography all the way down, if the next slide comes up, it goes all the way down to a, a census block. Uh, and there's an example of uh, of the area in Ithaca, New York, just south of where I used to live, called Cayuga Heights. And you can see that in that small, uh, much less than one mile square area there, each of those little um, purple lines outlines a census block, right? And I can tell you who lives on a lot of those blocks because they are my faculty colleagues at Cornell. And everybody knows that, who knows at Cornell. So basically, we, we have long held that, that, that um, publishing data at the block level is potentially highly disclosive, and that's not a secret. Next slide, please. Not sure why the slides take so long to change. I'm bringing up my own copy of them so I can go ahead. Um, they're they're showing up pretty quickly on the the broadcast one, John. So okay, so I'll just assume it shows up as soon as I ask for it. So, so this slide just summarizes again the level of geography that we actually publish redistricting data at, all the way down to those 10.6 million uh, blocks. It turns out there are only about six and a half million blocks in uh, in 2010 that were actually at risk to have population in them. But, the, but all of those race and ethnicity categories that are OMB approved, so all 126 of them, are tabulated at the block level with disclosure protection applied to them. But nevertheless, that's the level of detail that the data are sent out at. Next slide, please. So disclosure limitation is a technology. And differential privacy has allowed us to finally use the technology in the same way that economists statisticians and others have referred to it for many years in the, in the disclosure limitation literature, but not been able to effectively use. So economists call this abruption possibility frontier. Uh, statisticians 
forecasting statisticians call it a receiver operating characteristics curve. And SDL has been called the risk utility curve. And economists won't use utility in that sense, so I don't. But they're all exactly the same thing. And they describe a technology. They don't tell you how to pick a point on it. Next slide, please. You are looking at an actual description of the differentially private system that will be used for the 2018 end-to-end -end test of the census. Uh, it'll be applied to every block in the uh, in the uh, Rhode Island Providence, Rhode Island uh, area where they where the full field operations are being conducted. This is for a small block, so for a block uh, in this case of population 20. On the x-axis is the differential privacy global privacy loss budget, so epsilon. And on the y-axis is that um, total variation distance accuracy measure, which is interpreted as the percentage accuracy in the published data relative to publishing the data without any privacy protection at all. So at 100%, the top of the graph, that's an asymptote. That you can't get any more accurate than 100%. 100% is tabulating from the confidential data and just publishing it. So for example, if epsilon is set at one on the x-axis, then the published data will be about 81% as accurate as the confidential data. If epsilon is set at three, then the published data will be about 97% uh, as accurate, 95% as accurate as the confidential data, right? Every single point on this technology is differentially private. That is, it was all produced by a technology mathematically proven to enforce the privacy loss budget of Epsilon on the ensemble of publications from the test. But it's clear that the point 699.99 at the upper right hand edge of the, of the graph is far more disclosive than the point, point 0.133, which is near the lower left of the graph. So just to say that a system is differentially private is not to imply that it grants an enormous amount of worst case privacy protection to the population. It does grant some and it's provable, but you need to pick a point on this frontier. Next slide, please. It's a really, really hard problem trying to choose Epsilon. Cynthia Dwork, one of the inventors of differential privacy, uh, said that in one of her very early papers, the choice of epsilon is essentially a social question and beyond the scope of this paper. But whenever pressed to give examples, she says things like in the next bullet, well, say 0 0.01 or 0 0.1 or log two or log three. Uh, going back a slide, uh, log three is 1.1. .1, so that's basically the example I gave you with epsilon equal one and the, and the accuracy 81% of, uh, of the confidential data, all right? In, it, in its own internal implementation for on the map at the Census Bureau, Epsilon was set at 8.9 back in 2008 when that system was put into production. It was the first production system to use differential privacy. It didn't use exact differential privacy, it used an approximation when it was put in production in 2008. Apple's system uses two or four or eight according to the applications in their technical papers, but it's been reverse engineered and the, the external Auditors have said that it's really closer to 14. Google claims 4.39 in the Chrome browser. You may not have known that the Chrome browser had a differentially private query system built into it. Frank McSherry, one of the inventors of differential privacy, has argued on his blog that it's closer to nine by, again, reverse engineering the code that's in the Chrome browser. This is, this is public policy that we're talking about now, not computer science. That's a parameter in a system. And I will just say, so you understand this, at the Census Bureau's application, the engineers are not being allowed to set Epsilon. I am not allowed to set Epsilon. The Data Stewardship Executive Policy Committee chooses Epsilons, and we'll actually be meeting in about 15 minutes, and we will be doing some of that today, in fact. All right. The, the challenging problem for redistricting is the fitness for use application is highly constrained by the Supreme Court's one person, one vote decision which puts a tolerance of plus or minus one person on the size of congressional districts. State legislators are plus or minus 5%. Some states are stricter than that. In California, it's plus or minus five people. Um, the Voting Rights Act Section 2 puts restrictions on the, um, on the content of 
districts, it requires you to create a majority minority district when certain criteria are met. So the accuracy has to allow these two things to happen. The privacy interest is the statutory requirement not to publish exact identifying information and the public policy impl implications of the other uses of such detailed uh, race and ethnicity data published all the way down to the block. All right. So at the Census Bureau, we've been using multiple technologies to try to get the most accuracy we can out of the Epsilon budget. So there are three of them illustrated in, in this next slide. Next slide, please. The, the bottom one, I'm not going to talk about, that's the technology that's embedded in Apple iOS um, uh, 11 and in the Google Chrome browser. That's based on a, on a technology that never sees the confidential data. The Census Bureau sees the confidential data. So the first technology that we're actually considering using is the, um, uh, the, the green one in the middle. That's the one I just showed you an example of from the end-to-end -end test. The one that's being engineered for the 2020 Census improves on the accuracy at every privacy budget by doing a better job of spreading the geographic accuracy around the whole map and not just at the block level. All right. But once again, computer scientists have acted for many years like they think the privacy loss budget ought to be set down in the range around the uh, area where I labeled where computer scientists act like marginal social cost equals marginal social benefit. Social scientists, and I include official statisticians in that group, have acted like the accuracy level should be set uh, up here where the other bubble is. There's no computer science to support either position. Next slide, please. You have to figure out what this estimated marginal social benefit curve looks like. So I've drawn you one based on work that Ian Schmuddy and I have done with, with survey data that suggests that in survey responses to questions like, how important do you think confidentiality is? How important do you think accurate statistics are measured on Likert scales? We estimate that the, the public tolerance for privacy loss in this kind of statistic <clears throat> is in the, in, the, in the range that would permit accuracy of between 80 and, and 95%. So that in this case, that would be a budget of between one and a half and two pointed to by the arrow, okay? But it's actually a harder problem than that for the redistricting data because it's harder to say how you should draw those um, marginal social benefit curves. If you draw like the red one, on the last slide, next slide, uh, should be looking at slide 21. If you draw them like the red marginal social benefit curve, that's the one that favors accuracy. That says that getting accurate size and accurate enforcement of the Voting Rights Act is more important than privacy protection, relatively speaking. You'd go to a point with, a, with a, an epsilon of two and a half and accuracy of about 94%. But if you think the right choices are uh, favoring more privacy and accepting some of the error in redistricting, then you'd go to a point like one, which has accuracy of about 80, 81%. There's nothing in any of any statistical agency's laws that tells you how to represent the preferences for the trade-off between accuracy and privacy loss. This is new territory for official statisticians. And so, last slide, please. Since it's new ground for official statisticians, we really have to start talking about the implications of this social choice problem, the competing interests of accuracy and privacy protection, which we're not well equipped to talk about with traditional disclosure avoidance methods, but we can talk about them in terms of what point on the technology to choose for differentially private ones. This is very similar to the exercise of teaching people about margins of error that happened during the um, uh, during the whole of the 20th century as surveys replaced censuses for most measurement issues. Okay, thanks very much. I think I went a little over. I covered a bit of uh, Alex's ground, but uh, I apologize for going a little over. Thanks, John. Um, so it looks like uh, Alexandra has, um, her, her technical difficulties have been resolved. Uh, so we're gonna jump right to her. Um, I am going to uh, let everybody know um, we are probably, because of timing, going to go over our one o'clock um, scheduled endpoint. Um, if you can, please stick around with us, uh, and we'll get to questions at the end. I know I have several questions for John. Um, if not, uh, the recording will be made available later. 
So uh, without me, further I, ado. My, excuse me, Mike. Yeah. I have a hard stop at one, so I'm going to apologize and exit at one. Okay. I, I'm sorry. Oh, that's fine. Uh, we'll, we'll, we'll turn things over to, to Alexandra and go on from there. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Wonderful. Thank you. Um, I'm pleased to speak today um, to provide an introduction to differential privacy based on joint work to develop non-technical explanations of differential privacy. My goal is to leave you with an intuitive understanding of differential privacy to complement the other presentations you heard today. I should note that this presentation is the product of an interdisciplinary collaboration that leverages expertise from computer scientists, legal scholars, and information scientists through the Harvard Privacy Tools Project, and in particular through participation in our working group on bridging privacy definitions. When speaking about differential privacy, we're talking about privacy in the context of a statistical computation. This refers to any analysis or computation that takes um, personal data um, and transforms it into some output. Um, this, this can be thought of as uh, very broadly as, you know, outputs used for scientific inquiry, for um, commercial innovation, for investment decisions, or for policymaking decisions. And the central question is how can personal data be analyzed and shared in this way while ensuring the privacy of the individuals and the data will be protected? There are a large number of cautionary tales about the re-identification of data that were once believed to be anonymous. Um, for example, in the late 1990s, um, the Massachusetts Group Insurance Commission um, allowed researchers to access anonymized records summarizing information about all hospital visits made by state employees. Um, but before doing so, the agency removed names, addresses, social security numbers, and other pieces of information that could be used to identify individuals in the data. Um, but Professor Latanya Sweeney, who was then a, a graduate student at MIT, uh, set out to identify one of the records. She chose um, the governor of Massachusetts at the time, William Weld, um, and she obtained information about him, including his zip code, his, his birth date, and um, of course his, his gender, um, through um, voter registration records um, that were made available to the public for a small fee. And finding um, just one record in the anonymized medical claims data set that matched um, his gender, zip code, and date of birth enabled her to mail the governor a copy of his personal medical records. And this case illustrates a broader point that although a data set may appear to be anonymous, it could nevertheless be used to learn sensitive information about individuals. Following um, Professor Sweeney's famous demonstration along a series of attacks have been carried out against different types of data releases that have been anonymized using a wide range of techniques. And these attacks have shown that risks remain even if additional pieces of information, such as zip code, birth date, and sex are removed. Um, and um, when viewing all of these different um, attacks in, in all together, what you can take away um, is that a lack of rigor leads to unanticipated privacy failures. Um, there are new attacks leveraging um, new sources of auxiliary information um, as research progresses. Um, these attacks have shown that redaction of identifiers or releasing aggregate information is insufficient to protect privacy over the long term. And auxiliary information, the, the vast number of uh, data sources that may be available to an attacker is growing, and this should be taken into consideration. Um, and another um, important point, as, as John mentioned, is, is any useful analysis of personal data must leak some information about individuals. Um, and as um, many um, analyses are performed on the same data, um, you can experience blatant privacy loss. Um, information leakages accumulate as multiple analyses are performed or multiple um, 
data sets are released. And these are mathematical facts. Um, these are fundamental laws, not matters of policy. And so these um, observations um, led to um, research exploring um, theoretical approaches to privacy in the computer science literature. Um, and um, differential privacy emerged from this research beginning in uh, uh, 2006. Um, and, and this is a concept that's supported by a, a rich um, theoretical uh, foundation. And it's now in its first stages of implementation in real world use by organizations such as the US Census Bureau, Google, Apple, and Uber, as John mentioned. Um, so what is differential privacy? Um, it is a definition or a standard of privacy. It's not a single technique or algorithm. And it expresses a specific desiderata of an analysis that any information related risk to a person should not change significantly as a result of that person's information being included or not in the analysis. Um, to understand what this means, um, we can consider a scenario involving a certain computation, such as estimating the number of people on this call who have red hair. Ideally, this estimate should remain exactly the same, whether or not a single individual, such as myself, is included in the survey. However, ensuring this property exactly would require the total exclusion of my information from the computation. Um, as you can see here, um, if I remove my information, um, and then if we want to um, protect other people on the call, such as John or Michael, and we remove their information as well, and then continue with this line of argument for everyone on the call, we'll come to the conclusion that the personal information of every single person must be removed in order to satisfy that person's ideal scenario. To um, overcome this dilemma, differential privacy requires only that the output of the analysis remain approximately the same, whether I participate in the survey or not. That is, differential privacy allows for a deviation between the real world setting and the um, ideal world setting for myself. And a privacy parameter, epsilon, quantifies and limits the extent of the deviation between these two scenarios. Um, the, the parameter um, denoted by the Greek letter epsilon um, is referred to as the privacy loss parameter um, and it measures the effect of each individual's information on the output of the analysis. It can be also viewed as a measure of the additional privacy risk an individual could incur beyond the risk incurred in their ideal scenario. Because differential privacy is a general standard of privacy, it can be interpreted in different ways. Um, and in particular, we've, we've done research to explain its relationship to concepts from other disciplines, such as the law or traditional statistical disclosure limitation. Um, for example, some laws um, require that individuals be given an opportunity to opt out of a data release. And differential privacy um, can be viewed as essentially protecting an individual's information as if her information were not used in the analysis at all. Um, in a sense, it provides an automatic opt-out because it treats everyone in the data set essentially as if they have opted out of the analysis or release of their information. Differential privacy can also be understood to protect personally identifiable information. Differential privacy essentially ensures that using an individual's data will not reveal any personally identifiable information that's specific to her. Um, and that that information um, that's specific to her um, 
is, is very carefully qualified. Um, here, when we talk about information that's specific to an individual, we mean information that cannot be inferred unless that individual's information is used in the analysis. Differential privacy can also be understood to protect against inferences, generally. Uh, differential privacy essentially masks the contribution of any single individual, making it impossible to infer any information specific to an individual, including whether the, inf the individual's information was used at all. And Alexander, can I, uh, can I ask a, a clarifying question here? Yes. Um, so these, these guarantees, like with the absolute statements here, would be if if epsilon was set to zero, these would be absolute. But with epsilon as a as a a, a number above zero, that's the guarantee up to a certain level of uh, a certain level of certainty. Correct. That that's correct, and and that's what um, the qualifier here essentially is referring to is, is epsilon. Thank you. And, and what you might take away from these different interpretations of differential privacy is, is that um, it intuitively provides protection far beyond notions of identifiability or personally identifiable information um, found within the law or traditional techniques. Um, so how is differential privacy achieved? Um, an essential component of the differential privacy of a, of a differential privacy computation is the privacy loss parameter epsilon, as I mentioned. And this parameter determines how much noise is added to a computation and can be thought of as a privacy accuracy tuning knob. Each differentially private analysis can be tuned to provide more or less privacy, resulting in less or more accuracy, respectively, by changing the value of this parameter. For example, as this series of illustrations shows, um, increases in epsilon result in less noisy computations, um, but also less privacy protection. So you'll see how the line um, smooths out um, as the um, computations become more accurate as epsilon increases. Um, combinations of um, Differentially private com computations are also differentially private. This is one of the uh, unique features of differential privacy is that um, it's, um, it, it composes. Um, this is important for protecting privacy as every analysis results in some leakage of information about the individuals whose information is being analyzed. And this leakage accumulates with each analysis Differential privacy allows you to, to measure and bound this leakage across multiple analyses on the same individuals. Um, and as I mentioned, this is, this is unique to differential privacy. Most, if not all other known definitions of privacy do not measure the cumulative risk for multiple analyses or releases of data about the same individuals. Um, there have been a number of real world implementations of differential privacy. Um, John explained um, how the U.S. Census Bureau um, has used differential privacy and, and um, is exploring the use of differential privacy in the 2020 census. Um, but there have also been commercial implementations by um, Google, um, which uses uh, differential privacy in the Chrome browser um, to collect information um, about um, malicious software and, and how it affects um, user browser settings. Um, it allows Google to, to monitor um, trends in, in these malicious attacks um, while not um, collecting any information specific to individual users. Um, Apple uses differential privacy to collect usage statistics um, through iOS 10. Um, the information is collected to improve keyboard suggestions and to make suggestions for emojis. Um, and then this graph here shows um, the most popular emojis um, in the United States. And this was collected um, using a differentially private mechanism. Um, and Uber also has implemented differential privacy in applications that allow analysts to learn information, such as the average ride distance in a given city without learning information specific to individual rides. 
Um, so in conclusion, um, I'll go over some of the key features of differential privacy again. It provides protection that's robust to a wide range of potential privacy attacks um, because it's a formal model that takes a very conservative approach to privacy protection. Um, it's able even to prote provide protection against attacks that are unknown at the time of deployment. It protect, uh, protects privacy um, independent of the methods and resources used by a potential attacker. There's no need to take into account um, what the resources of an, an attacker might be. Um, it, uh, differential privacy provides protection regardless of the um, external data sources that the um, attacker may have available. Um, differential privacy provides provable privacy guarantees with respect to the cumulative risk from successive data releases. And it has the benefit of transparency, as it's not necessary to maintain secrecy around a differentially private computation or its parameters. And it can be used to provide broad public access to data or data summaries in a privacy preserving way. Um, and if you're interested in, in reading more about differential privacy, here's some resources ranging from less technical resources, including um, our primer, which this presentation is based on, um, to more technical um, resources, including the, the last resource, which is a, a book on, on the algorithmic foundations of differential privacy. Um, thank you. Great, thank you, Alex. And I, I believe John had the drop off. John, are you still there? No, he's not. Okay, so um, so we will unfortunately have to do questions without John. Um, but still, if you have any questions for John's presentation, please uh, enter those into the Google document and we can try to follow up with him afterwards. Um, Alex, uh, while folks are putting their questions in for you uh, into the Google Doc, um, just a couple quick questions. So uh, what types of information does differential privacy actually protect? Well, differential privacy protects any information that's specific to an individual. Um, unlike traditional de-identification techniques, which focus on suppressing identifying information, such as names and addresses, but may leave other pieces of individual level information available to a potential attacker, differential privacy doesn't distinguish between identifying and non-identifying information, for example, and provides protection for all information that could be learned about an individual based on that individual's participation in an analysis. And does, like, what, what types of analyses can be performed? Are, are there any types of calculations or, or statistics that you can't generate using a, a differentially private approach? Um, a, a large number of, of different types of statistical analyses can be performed um, with differential privacy guarantees. Um, for example, there are algorithms um, known to exist for producing simple counts, um, histograms, cumulative distribution functions, linear regressions, and machine learning analyses, um, among many others with differential privacy guarantees. Um, Differential privacy can even be used to produce um, synthetic microdata or individual level data, um, like what John described um, with the, the Census Bureau application. Um, and, and these data can be thought of as, as fake data produced from a statistical model based on the original data. They resemble the original sensitive data in format, um, and the results are similar, whether performed on the synthetic data or original data for a large class of analyses. So to, um, to interpret that to some degree, um, the data that come out of differentially private analyses are, are generally either um, calculations that have had noise or, or like some degree of noise added to them to, to, to move the number slightly or they're they're actually synthetic data generated from the underlying patterns in the, in the, in the original raw data, correct? That's correct, yes. Uh, great, so a uh, couple questions that have come in from the audience. Um, are you aware of any commercial solutions 
uh, that allow applying differential privacy to data sets? Um, I've heard that there are um, companies developing tools like that. I'm not sure any of them are available um, yet, though I know these things are in the pipeline. So kind of following up on that, um, if, if an organization were interested in um, using differential privacy uh, for their public data releases, um, like what kind of, of burden would that entail? Like what would they need, what would they need to do? Like what kind of skills would they need to have in order to start applying differential privacy? Um, in, in the near term, um, I think having a background in, in computer science is a prerequisite. Um, there are um, some um, pieces of source code on GitHub um, that um, have been made available as prototypes for, for researchers to work with. Um, but I think moving forward, what, what's needed is, you know, off the shelf tools that, that people um, without um, background in, in differential privacy could use. Um, and we've been working to develop, or members of our team have been working to develop um, differential privacy tools um, that um, lay audiences can use, that people without a substantial background in, in theoretical computer science would be able to use um, to make their data available um, through the um, Harvard uh, Dataverse uh, data repository platform. Um, so there are some tools that are in development to make um, differential privacy available um, to um, non-technical um, researchers and, and others who would like to make their data available. Um, so another question, um, can you speak a little bit about the, the effect of, of sample size or database size on the, the usability of the resulting data for any given privacy budget or, or epsilon value? Um, generally, the, the longer the data set, you know, the more records there are, um, the more accurate your statistics can be when using differential privacy for a given um, um, level of privacy protection. Um, though high dimensional data, wider data with, with more attributes per record, um, it can be more challenging. Um, and, and in those cases, um, interactive mechanisms are, are often chosen. Um, so query-based approaches where um, data users can, can submit queries and, um, that and allow the, the computation of statistics um, on certain attributes at a time. So um, with any differentially private implementation, short of, of going the synthetic data routes, um, each query against the data, each analysis that you perform counts against your, your privacy budget, your, your epsilon there. What happens when you've hit the, the, the analysis that actually meets or exceeds your epsilon? What happens to future queries after that? Well, there are a couple of different approaches to this problem. Um, so one, you could have um, a budget set for each user. Um, and so this, would be based on the assumption that users aren't colluding um, and comparing answers. Um, but in those cases, each individual could have their own privacy budget that, that um, isn't eroding the overall privacy budget with each query. Um, and another solution to this problem is, is synthetic data. Um, so when, once the synthetic data are produced, um, that's, um, that only has an effect on the, on the privacy budget once um, and not every time someone downstream uses the synthetic data. So another question from the audience here. Um, are there any potential attacks against differential privacy that are of concern? Um, it's, a, it's a good question. I'm, I'm not the, the person um, to answer it. Um, I'm not 
familiar with um, attacks. I, I, I understand that there may be some um, side channel attacks, um, but um, I, I would point you to um, papers in the literature on that topic. I'm, I'm not familiar. And another one here from the audience. Um, are there any good resources for, for getting started on actually implementing a differentially private approach to data release? Um, I've, I've discussed a, a number of, of different um, implementations of, of differential privacy by organizations like US Census Bureau, Google, Apple, and Uber, as well as um, research. Um, at Harvard and, and other research institutions to develop um, general purpose tools for differential privacy analysis that can be used um, in many different settings. Great, and uh, I think that's the last of the questions we have from the audience. So uh, with that, uh, I'm gonna uh, thank you, Alex, and, and I'll extend a, a belated thank you to John who had the drop off um, for the excellent presentations, and I'm going to turn things back over to Amelia to wrap things up. Uh, thanks, Michael, and thanks everybody for joining us today. Apologies again for the technical issues, but we really appreciate those of you who stuck around. Um, many, many thanks to Michael, to Alex, to John uh, for fantastic presentations and for taking a really complex subject matter and making it a little bit more accessible for those of us in these spaces. Um, so I just wanted to remind folks that if you did register in advance, you will receive a copy of the recording and some detailed notes when they're ready, um, which hopefully will be soon. Um, if you haven't uh, registered for this, please email Amelia or myself. Uh, you can see our emails on the screen. Um, and we're really looking forward to continuing the discussion. The Q&A document will remain available online. We're going to see if we can um, perhaps continue backfilling some questions there if folks have other issues that they're interested in. Um, in raising or feel free to reach out to us or Michael or John or Alex um, with whatever other questions you might have. Um, thank you all again and I hope everybody has a great afternoon. All right. Goodbye.